was there. Would you stand as we read this morning? And my subject, it's in the bulletin there, Jesus confronts religion. And what he had, does here, he has a personal conversation with Nicodemus, and it was actually at Nicodemus' uh, uh, initiative, he come to see Jesus. And we find out here that Nicodemus was right full of religion and tradition, but uh, Jesus had something to say about that. So let's look at John chapter 3. We read a few verses here, and then I've, I'll mention several verses as we go along this morning. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night, and that's questionable, isn't it? He came by night. He said unto him, Rabbi, we, who's the we? It was only him that showed up. He was representing, I guess, the rest of the Pharisees. We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And we'll mention the miracles that he did prior to this statement. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? That sounds quite ridiculous, doesn't it? And it was as ridiculous as it sounds. Jesus was not talking about a natural birth. Being born again, he was talking about a spiritual birth. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, whither it goeth, and so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, I like this part, Art thou a master in Israel, and knowest not these things? In other words, you're a ruler of the Jews, a teacher, among the spiritual elite, top of the Pharisees, you don't know these things? Now, it's not mentioned here, but later on it says, If the blind lead the blind, they both fall in the ditch. Correct? So here's Jesus answering Nicodemus, You're, You don't know these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that which we do know and testify, and that which we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you heavenly things. And I'm going to end the reading of the scripture there. Lord Jesus, we ask your presence to be with us this morning. Help us, Lord, to impart that which you have placed upon our heart, how Jesus comes uh, face to face or head to head with religion. Help us today to impart uh, uh, spiritual truths to the people. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Nicodemus religion didn't merit too much when it came to the subject of eternal life. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again in order to see, to have, or to enter into eternal life. So this morning, uh, it's the Bible versus popular opinion when it comes to the subject of being born again. A couple of weeks ago, and even last week, we made mention, we're not saved by our good works. And how people today would like to believe that. You know, I'm a good person. I do this. I do that. And uh, God uh, wouldn't send a good person to hell. Uh, we're not saved by our good works. We need to obey the scriptures. And it talks in the scripture. We need to be born again. So I restate again today. We're not saved by our good works. We're not saved by virtue of a wonderful heritage that we may have behind us. We're not saved by traditions. How are we saved? We're saved by obeying the word of God. Amen. We're saved by obedience to the gospel, obedience to the death, burial, and resurrection. And that comes through our repentance and our baptism in Jesus' name and being filled with his spirit. 
It's not worth it this morning to take our chances. We just need to do it the Bible way. Amen. All right. And so uh, we're still focusing on some aspects of salvation. Uh, let us give you some background information here leading up to Nicodemus or Jesus' conversation one with the other. It's in chapter 3 of John. There's some things that happened clear back in chapter 1 up to chapter number 3. We'll give it to you outline form, then we'll deal with it in study here this morning. We find out in chapter 1 of John that the Word was God, the Word was with God, how the Word was manifest in the flesh. Jesus or John was the one that introduced Jesus to the world as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John brings uh, Andrew and Philip, or excuse me, Andrew and Simon Peter to Jesus. Jesus also finds Philip. Philip in turn finds Nathaniel. That's chapter 1. It goes into chapter 2 where Jesus performs his first miracle, that of turning the water to wine, the second miracle, the cleansing of the temple, and a first sign that he gives to them. He said to destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. He wasn't talking about a physical building. He was talking about his own body. And then into chapter 3, with this conversation with Dick Nicodemus here, it was a secret meeting. Notice that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. If he had come in the daytime, his co-workers would have known he took time off work to go see Jesus, and that just wouldn't have been too popular. The subject was, you must be born again. So let's go back to chapter number 1 and look at the scriptures here leading up to the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. In John 1 and 1, if you bring that up on the screen, brother, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. It goes on to say that the world was made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He's the light, and the light was the life of men. Dropping down to verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. I'm thankful to know that in Scripture. And so uh, we had mentioned back a few Sundays ago, we do not believe in a Trinity doctrine as such. Jesus is the one and all. He's God. And God robed himself in flesh. He's the word. He comes down to earth. He didn't send another. He came himself. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, the word has the last say. The word is the final authority. You can depend upon the word of God. You can depend upon the Bible. Let's go back several Sundays. The inspiration of the scripture, the verbal inspiration. It is the word of God and it is final in its authority. In verse number 7 of chapter 1 here, John, being the writer of this gospel of John, he said he was a witness of these things. An eyewitness. Uh, eyewitness to what things? An eyewitness to the word. He was an eyewitness to God robed in flesh and God making himself manifest in flesh. In verse 11, it records that Jesus came to his own. His own received him not. But as to many of them that has received him, to them he gave eternal life. I'm thankful that he came down to us in the form of a man that we may receive eternal life. Verse 12, those that did receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now, those that believe on his name, those that are born of God. John was not just a writer of the gospel of New Testament. He was the one, the voice in the wilderness, uh, and his message was prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths, a highway in the wilderness for our God. He said in verse 27, chapter 1 here again, that there was one coming after him whose shoes he wasn't worthy to reach down and unloose. He was talking about the word made flesh. God made flesh. Jesus coming. He wasn't worthy to unloose his shoes. He would be the one to baptize us with the Holy Ghost. Wow, quite a, uh, quite a, a scenario here. Uh, there was something to look ahead to, an anticipation where the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us, uh, God in Jesus, Jesus going to be in you and I, right? And so this was some anticipation. So John was indeed the one that introduced Jesus to the world in verse 29, still chapter 1, he said, Behold, 
the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Uh, it was uh, revealed to John uh, who the one would be and how he would recognize him. And when he recognized him, he would uh, cry out, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It was John that brought Andrew and Simon Peter to Jesus, said, We have found the Messiah. That was the hope of any Jewish person. They were waiting for Messiah to come. And here's John declaring, I've already met him. I've seen him. I've seen the signs. I know who he is. Proclaimed in the world as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now, Andrew and uh, Peter, I want you to come and meet Jesus in person. That's verse 41. We have found the Messiah, which is called the Christ. John's ministry from that time on began to fade into the background, and Jesus' ministry began to open up. Jesus turn and he found Philip in verse number 43 and after he makes himself known to Philip Philip in turn goes to Nathaniel and Nathaniel comes to Jesus in verse 45 Jesus had a conversation with Nathaniel too in verse 47 and 48 it was quite unique Nathaniel had said to uh, uh, John there's can any good thing come out of Nazareth and he said well come and see and that's quite an invitation isn't it if you don't believe what you hear come and see and so Nathanael was brought into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus' first words to Nathanael was, uh, Oh, Nathanael, he says, uh, you're having a hard time to believe. I know you're not Thomas as such. You're finding it hard to believe. You're looking at me and seeing me. Philip, I saw you way back when you were under the fig tree. Nathanael said, Whoa, uh, here's a guy operating gifts of the Spirit or something. How would he know I was under? What did I say? Whatever. And Jesus is telling him, I saw that, so it was a sign to him. Yeah, he's more special than just a man. There's something here. He is God. He knows everything about me from beginning to end. He saw me when I was under the fig tree. So that's chapter 1. Then we get into chapter 2 of John, where Jesus performed his first <laughs> miracle, the marriage in the Cana of Galilee, where he turned the water to wine. Jesus and his disciples we're attending a wedding and a wedding feast. And Jesus' mother at this time knew that he was special, that he was Messiah. And she tries to put him forth to the public before his time had come. And so uh, she says to Jesus, they've run out of water. And he said, woman, what do I have to do with thee? He wasn't sassing his mother. So she would just tell him, mom, mom, hang on. You're racing things a little bit. My time has not yet come. Just, just hold it. And she's still racing things. She turns to the side and said, just do whatever he tells you to do. <laughs> and Jesus told him, he said, I want you to fill the water pots with water. They did so. And then he turned the water to wine and he told them to bear it to the governor of the feast. The governor of the feast tested and he said, how is it? He said, usually when we have these feasts, you save the best wine uh, or serve the best wine at the first and save the <laughs> the." Uh, Worst stuff, if I can word it that way, to the end. But he said, you've served the best stuff at the end. Jesus made the better wine. So that was the, and then the second miracle comes on right behind that one where he cleanses the temple. And he said, my father's house is to be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves by your trafficking and selling stuff in the house of God. It's not for business, it's for prayer. So he overturned the money changers' tables and drove them out of the temple. That's verse 15 of chapter 2. The crowd was shocked when he did this, and no man dare say a word to him or what he'd done. They always realized he's got authority. And so they asked him, uh, by what authority do you do these things? And he put forth a sign to them to destroy this temple in three days. I'll raise it up. And there was a kind of conversation that went around because of that. Uh, he thinks he's somebody that can build a, a whole temple in just a few days when it was many days or months and years in the making. He wasn't talking about that physical temple that they worshipped in. He was talking about his own body, uh, prophesying that it would go to be crucified, but he would raise it up in three days' time. So many believed when they saw the miracles which he did. Is it any different today? 
people like to see something unusual, something spectacular. It even goes back to Nathaniel uh, when Jesus told him he saw him in the garden when he knew nobody's around to see him. They're looking for something special to really believe that Jesus is who he said he was. Rather, we find in the New Testament, signs are supposed to follow them that believe. Why are the believers looking for signs? They ought to be the ones doing the work and signs following them. And we are living in the times of the signs. Then we go into chapter 3 of John that I wanted to make the uh, meat of my message for this morning uh, where he confronts religion. And can I say it from the pulpit today? Religion is most of what makes up Christianity, but religion is not what Christianity needs. What Christianity needs is salvation. Religion is just a form of godliness that denies the power thereof. We need Jesus in its fullness, don't, don't we? And so Jesus confronts religion right on. What do you mean religion? Nicodemus was a religious man. He was a Pharisee. He was a ruler. Matter of fact, he had studied and was one of the top Pharisees as a ruler. He knew religion. He knew uh, all the things about uh, other religions down pat, but he didn't have the power to go along with it. He had just a form and a tradition. He was a religious man. I hope no one would throw rocks at me this morning if I tell you there's even a lot of Pentecostals that's just religious. What do we mean by that? Going through a form, gut tradition of mom and dad, hanging on the skirts, and going through this day and haven't got the experience. You need to be born again. Woo! You need to be born again. There was a couple of amens back here. What about some more? Jesus confronts religion. Religion cannot save you. It's no more than your good works. It won't save you either. Tradition by itself will not save you. We need to be born again of the water and of the spirit. That's how we're going to inherit eternal life. So, at the meat of the message, you must be born again. Jesus didn't pull any punches when he had this conversation with Nicodemus. Now, had he have been confronting a guy off the street that was searching uh, for salvation, he might not have been as rough. But here was Nicodemus, a ruler, uh, a teacher of things concerning the law, and one that thought he had everything down pat and knew what was right. He confessed he didn't know everything because he's coming to Jesus. And how is he coming? He's coming secretly. He comes by night so none of the rest of his peers would know what he's doing just to inquire. Well, Jesus exposed him. You must be warned again. Secret meeting. Nicodemus knew there was something more to Jesus than what he had himself. And he was a bit hungry to know what that was. And he thought... Uh, I really don't want to lose my job as a religious leader and one who traffics in religion as such. He was held in bondage and in chains of tradition. Nicodemus says to Jesus in verse, 22, or verse 2, he said, I know you have come from God because no man could do the works that you're doing except God be with him. No man can do these miracles. What miracles was he referring to? There's only two that happened up to this point. Uh, I can try all my uh, Jewish tradition and religion and all of God. I can't turn water into wine. I wouldn't dare take a whip and try to cleanse the temple and, and, and send out all those that's making merchandise of the house of God. But you did. There was two miracles and a sign and then you said to destroy the temple and you'd raise it up in three days. Man, you must be greater than any one of us. And so these were the things that he was referring to. No man can do these miracles or show these signs except God be with him. The closest that could come to raising up a temple in three days would be the Jehovah's Witnesses that can do it in, three, in 24 hours. They didn't exist back in Jesus' time. That's just in our day, correct? So and he was, wasn't looking at it right. Jesus cut right to the quick. He didn't hold back any punches because he didn't have much sympathy for religious people. The bottom line here, Nicodemus, let's just cut it to the chase. You must be born again. 
That was Jesus' first word to Nicodemus. Come in the conversation. Nicodemus did all the talking up to that point. And Jesus says, you must be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then in verse 3 he says, nor can he enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus asked a stupid as well as an impossible question. How is it possible for a man to be born again? Verse number four, and he puts the scenario there of a natural birth. Can he, as a grown man, enter into his mother's womb and be born again? That was an impossibility. No, Nicodemus, that's not what I'm talking about. Jesus said that was just born of the flesh. Your natural birth was a fleshly birth. I'm talking about a spiritual birth here. I'm talking about being born of the water and of the spirit. All right, a spiritual birth, being born again. And so marvel not that I send you, Nicodemus, you must be born again if you're looking to inherit eternal life. Natural birth don't get you to heaven. You need a spiritual birth. Traditions and, and uh, religion doesn't equate, good works doesn't equate to salvation. You need to be born again. So uh, Jesus asked Nicodemus the question, how is it that you, being a religious leader, you can't understand natural things? How much less could you understand spiritual things if I mention that to you? That's verse 10. Nicodemus, here's his credentials again. He was a master in Israel. He was a religious leader. He was educated in theology. But it's like the blind lead and the blind that both are going to fall in the ditch. He was preaching as a profession rather than a calling, a vocation rather than a ministry. Nicodemus, you're just trafficking in religion. You're looking for a paycheck at the end of the week. Well, there's more to this than a paycheck at the end of the week. We want to prepare people for eternity. Amen. <laughs> Need to prepare people for eternity. So Jesus was not referring to a natural birth, but a spiritual verse. At birth, he said, that which is natural is first, but after that comes that which is spiritual. Two different births he was talking about here, a fleshly one and a spiritual one. He said in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Followed up the saying, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So marvel not. That I send it, you must. Everybody say, you must. You must be born again. It wasn't just at will or it wasn't just optional. Here it was a necessity. You must be born again. In other words, Nicodemus, up to this point, all your education, all your teaching to other people and everything, it just comes under tradition and religion. It, it's not far enough. You've got to have salvation. You need to be born again of the water and of the spirit. Religion is not enough. Amen. Religion is not enough. He said, uh, you must be born again to see or to enter the kingdom of God. Now, there's a lot of religious people that have their own ideas as to what equates to salvation. The first one and that you hear very often is, well, just believe. Anyone ever hear that? Just believe. Mark chapter, no, excuse me, that's Luke. Luke chapter 24, verse 47. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. There's more to it than just believing. I can take you through the scriptures where those who believed were obedient and they were baptized and they received the Holy Ghost. And so it's more than just believe. Another, well, just call on the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. They're using the uh, phrase that uh, the two in jail, Paul and Silas, uh, made, made to the Philippian jailer. Just believe. That was a midnight, that was a, uh, an emergency situation where a jailer was ready to take his life. And uh, he come in with like, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Just believe. Oh, it didn't end there. If you read a few more verses down, the same hour of the night, he took them out, washed their stripes, and he, they were baptized. So there's more to it than just calling on the name of the Lord or just confess to Jesus. And I hear this one often, you're only responsible to walk in the light that you know. Well, if that's the case, please don't tell me anything else. <laughs> I'm all right the way I am. 
right? Uh, don't tell me, because I, I want to be saved. And if I'm not responsible, it's the only thing more than I do right now. Just leave me alone. <laughs> but you see, that's all a deception, isn't it? The real question is the one that Nicodemus asked to Jesus. And, and Jesus answered him, you must be born again. It wasn't an option. He said, you must be born again of the water and of the spirit. Spiritual things and not just religious things. Now, spiritual things. Remember back in the Old Testament how Moses lifted up a brazen serpent on a pole? What had happened? The, the Israelites had done sin and, and, and something had happened where they were deceased. And so he raises this brazen serpent up upon him. He said, if you look on this, he said, then you'll be cured of that disease. Uh, that's not in, in vogue today, uh, but it happened back there. It was a sign looking ahead to Jesus who would be lifted up on Calvary as the source of all of our healing. And how people today have lifted up and they make a fetish of this and, and they'll go through all kinds of things. Here's an idol, look on that, you'll be healed of this disease. Idols don't heal. Right? Jesus heals. The brazen serpent. Uh, do you understand the spiritual significance or is this just darkness like the same as entering into a, a mother's womb to be born a second time? Spiritual things like this. Whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Again, we can take you to the ones that did believe on him, how they were obedient to the scriptures, what they did, and that merited eternal life. John chapter number 7 Verse 30 and 39. Tim, that was the one I was trying to think of when you asked me the scriptures this morning. Let's turn there for a moment. John 7, 38, 39. And we're going to find here, he that believeth on me as the scripture said. Wow, I like that portion of scripture, don't you? Just believe. Call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is. He that believeth on me as the scripture has said. There it is. Believe them as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Well, what's that? Let's go to the next verse. This spake he of the spirit. What's that? You must be born again. Born of the water and the spirit. If you believe on him, he that believe in this baptized shall be saved. Here's believe on him as the scripture has said. This spake he of the spirit which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Jesus was not yet glorified. A uh, couple more verses there if you got it. If not, it's okay. We'll go on. But here in John, there it is. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is a prophet. In other words, he's telling us the way to be saved. I'm thankful for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, aren't you? Yeah. Amen. He that believes on me, as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake ye of the Holy Ghost, which they that believe in him should receive. The Holy Ghost is the born of the Spirit that Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about. Baptism in Jesus' name, being born of the water, and both are necessary to say, I've been born again. John 3 and 16. Let's look what it says here. You should be able to quote this one by heart, shouldn't you? A lot of people use this one. A lot of religious people, a lot of Christians Love this verse. Look what it says. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, if you get the next verse on that, let's read it to Tim. Verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. It's not about condemnation, is it? But that the world through him might be saved. I'm thankful Jesus came, he was crucified, he was buried, he did raise again the third day, and that temple which he said he would raise, and made eternal life possible for us. And so uh, we can be saved today. What's it take? You've got to be born again. Born again of the water and of the spirit. So in conclusion this morning, boy, I'm being done early, aren't I? And I just went after Butch for being early on Tuesday night. <laughs> <laughs> I better apologize to you now, bro. <laughs> Amen. John was the forerunner of Jesus. 
and the one making the way for the ministry of Jesus to follow. And John proclaimed Jesus to the world. John decreased, Jesus increased, Jesus met up with the religious man Nicodemus, and he was as much as said, Nicodemus, your religion won't save you. If you want eternal life, you must be born again, born of the water and of the spirit. We're talking about the aspects and essentials of salvation, and I want to stand here and reiterate again this morning. If you want to be saved, if you want to have eternal life, if you want to go to heaven, you must be born again. Born of the water and of the spirit. We find that out from Jesus' conversation with Dick and Demas, and we conclude that the born-again experience is indeed essential to one's salvation. Born of the water and born of the spirit. Sister, if you come back to the piano. Amen. We're going to sing a song. And we're going to stand this morning. Hallelujah. I must have been speaking real fast this morning. I hope you were listening fast. We got through a, a whole 45 minutes to an hour and a half an hour. <laughs> All right. Praise God. Sister, let's.